Galatians 3 says, oh, you stupid Galatians. You can put in all the other translations, dear idiots, you fools, you senseless, you unreflecting. There's a lot of translations that makes it worse. But he says, who have bewitched you, you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was graphically portrayed as being crucified amongst you? This one thing I want to know. Did you receive? Now he goes on salvation, the spirit and everything. Because you obeyed the law or because you heard the message of faith? Okay, Why, how did you receive? By the message of faith or because you obeyed the law? Then verse 5 is a very important scripture. He says, then he who supplies you, amplified Bible, with his marvelous Holy Spirit, and does wonders among you. Does he do so because you do what the law command or because of hearing the message of faith again another time? He says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. The whole law is a curse. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, that the blessings of Abram might come upon the Gentiles, listen to the rest, so that we might receive the Spirit, the promise, excuse me, let's put it in the word, the promise of the Spirit by faith, okay? So, because of Christ's crucifixion, we now can receive the blessings of Abram, but upon the blessings of Abram, the promised Holy Spirit. What will the promised Holy Spirit do? He will help us to work wonders. Okay? Amen. And that's what Jesus said. The works that I do, shall you do also? Greater works than these shall you do? Because I go to my Father. If I do not go, I cannot send you the Comforter. But if I go, I will send you the Comforter. And He is the one that will then assist you in doing the signs and the wonders and the miracles. But the law can't do it. That's why Christ had to die to redeem us from the curse of the law. To give us the promise of the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Holy Spirit came one Christ crucified B you and I hearing the message of faith okay so see if I am out of the law, not an outlaw, <laughs> if I'm out of the law, I can have a supply because Christ is crucified, hearing the message of faith, and I'm out of the law. Romans 10 says the following, verse 4. Christ is the end of the law to all who believe. Because Moses described the righteousness that is of faith like this. Oh, the righteousness of the law like this. He that doeth it shall live by it. But the righteousness which is of faith speaks. It says, do not say in your heart. Who shall go up to heaven to bring Christ down? Who shall go to the abyss to bring Christ up? But this word is very near you. It's in your heart and it's in your mouth. You can just speak it. So verse 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And we have that drilled into us. We have that preached to us. We have that quoted. We had the fridge magnets. We had the bumper stickers. We had everything about faith comes by hearing. But verse 16 says, Well did Isaiah said, Who believed our report? And to whom was the arm of the Lord revealed? So then faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing what? The message of the Christ crucified. That is the message of Isaiah 53. Lord, who hath believed our report? To whom was the arm of the Lord revealed? He has grew up like a tender plant out of dry ground. Then he goes on to say, he had no form nor comeliness, yet he took our sorrows and took our griefs, and he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So the message is a 
full salvation message that Christ did when he died on the cross. Dying on the cross, he redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us so that the blessings of Abraham and I come upon the Gentiles and we might receive the promise of the Spirit by faith. So we have a supernatural supply of the Holy Spirit that will help us do wonders all over the world if we understand what Christ did when he died on the cross. What happened when the Holy Spirit came because of Christ dying on the cross? And if we then take the message of faith and don't go back to the law, have the word in us, say the right words, receive the promise of the Holy Spirit, we will be the greatest wonder workers on the face of the earth. 1 Corinthians 2 uh, verse 9, the wonderful scripture that says, I, as it is written, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has come upon the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. So I got to have the supply of the spirit to hear from God things that no eye has ever seen. But verse 7 and 8 says, if the rulers knew who the Lord of glory was, they would never have crucified him. So it's the crucifixion of Christ that brought about the fullness of an open heaven, that brought about stuff that nobody has ever seen or heard of, that's ready and prepared to be revealed to anybody that will receive it by the Spirit. Because the natural man cannot receive it, because no man knows the things of God except the Spirit of God, but God will reveal them unto us by His Spirit. So the natural man cannot receive what we're teaching. It's for spiritual people that says, my goodness, I'm not going to sit and warm a church pew for the rest of my life. I'm going to be a miracle worker. I'm going to be a sign and a wonder worker. I'm going to bring about stuff that nobody has ever seen before. Man, if we look at the cloud of witnesses and we think what they did in 1904, 1906, 1946, man, they're going to look like, you know, they played in a kindergarten and they were busy with a Sunday school picnic. And they're going to say, my goodness, why couldn't I just be born now? And that's who we're going to be. Hmm? So we've got to be spiritual. What makes us spiritual? Romans 8, let's start maybe at verse 6. Now the mind of the flesh, or the carnal, or the natural man, which is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit, is death. Death that comprises all the mysteries arising from sin both year and year after. But the mind of the Holy Spirit is life. Peace, now and forever. That is because the mind of the flesh with its carnal thoughts and purposes is hostile to God. It does not submit itself to God's law deeds. It cannot. So then those who are living the life of the flesh, catering to the appetites and impulses of their carnal nature, cannot please or satisfy God or be acceptable to Him. But you are not living the life of the flesh. In other words, a natural, carnal, fleshly life. You are living the life of the Spirit. If the Holy Spirit of God really dwells within you. But if anyone does not possess the Holy Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He does not belong to Christ. He is not truly a child of God. But if Christ lives in you, then your natural body is dead by reason of sin and guilt. But the Spirit is alive because of the righteousness that he imputes to you. And if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells, circle, in you, then he who raised up Christ Jesus from the dead will also restore to life your mortal, short-lived, perishable bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. Let's do verse 13 too. For if you live according to the dictates of the flesh, you will surely die. But if through the power of the Holy Spirit... You are habitually putting to death, making extinct, deadening the evil deeds prompted by the body. You shall really and genuinely live forever. Verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, rather is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, 
who also make it intercession for us. Colossians 2. Verse 13. And you who were dead in trespasses and in uncircumcision of your flesh, your sensuality, your sinful, carnal, natural, fleshly nature. God brought to life together with Christ, having freely forgiven us all our transgressions. Having canceled and blotted out and wiped away the handwriting, that's the law, of the note with its legal decrees and demands which was in force and stood against us, this note with its regulations, decrees and demands, listen, he set it aside, he cleared completely out of the way by nailing it to his cross. Cancelled. Blotted. Wiped away set it aside, then completely cleared it away by nailing it to the cross. Said, if you want to go back to the law, over my dead body. That was my revelation in 1980. And God showed me how that saying came into, over my dead body. That's where it came from. A, a legal statement in the early church. When the people wanted to go back to the law, they said, over his dead body. If you want to go back to the law, you're going to nullify what Jesus Christ did. He was nailed on that cross to take away the law with his legal decrees that accused you and said, you are a sinner, you're wicked, you're wrong, you're dirty, you're evil. He took it, wiped it away, cleared it away, blotted it out, canceled it out, and now... Christ redeemed us from that whole curse of the law, being made a curse for us by hanging on the tree so that now we can have the blessings of Abraham and the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now he who supplies you with that marvelous Holy Spirit and does wonders among you, will he do it because you go back to the law, the song we wrote, or because you stick to the message of faith that we heard by grace and take the full message, go for the supply of the Holy Spirit, trust in what Jesus did on the cross and you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Stop thinking carnal fleshly thoughts. He who thinks spiritual is spiritual. He who thinks carnal fleshly naturally is natural. So what shall we say of all these things? God is for us. He didn't spare his son, nail him to a tree to make sure that nothing can accuse you, nothing can condemn you, Nothing can judge you. Nothing can stand against you. You're free to be a spiritual person to move in the power of the Holy Ghost. Verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the natural man or the flesh or the law, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh the natural carnal thing God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit so chapter 6 is more or less what we read in the previous thing, we were raised together, quickened together by baptism in Christ, what we just read in Colossians and stuff like that, okay? So chapter 6 talks about baptized in Christ, raised in Christ to newness of life. But chapter 7 is the questionable. <laughs> debatable. Okay. Theological unanswered chapter. When I want to do good, I find evil. Who shall deliver me from this wicked man that I am? Oh, wretched man that I am. Who can, who can deliver me? Every time, I, you know, then I find this law in my members, the law of sin. Then I find this other law in my mind, the law of the spirit. And I'm in this dual character. And then people say we have two natures. No, I'm not. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Amen. So some way we must find out what Romans 7 really says. Know ye not, brethren. I mean, 7 does come before 8. Yeah. 
So if we want to come to no condemnation, what shall we say of all these things? Uh, you know, if we want to come to that, we've got to understand seven somehow. Otherwise, why is it that the condemnation, judgment thing creeps in and creeps in and creeps in and creeps in? Why is the law still so strong, although we believe in grace? Why does the law keep on jumping up, jumping up? Because of chapter 7. That's what Paul says. When I want to do good, I find evil. When I want this law, I want that law. So Paul is crying out, would somebody somehow, somewhere help us to get from 6 to 8? From dead in Christ, risen to newness of life, to no condemnation. Can we skip this? Law thing for a change and get over it. Thank you, Paul. Let's go. <laughs> know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. But if the husband is dead, she is loosed from the law of the husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ this is my body broken for you there is a new and living way to the holy of holies through the veil which is his body Okay, we are dead to the law through the body Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law through his body being nailed to the tree. He took the handwriting that stood against us, blotted it, wiped it away, canceled it, put it aside, took it out by nailing it to his cross on the body so that we can receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. So we can have a supply of the Holy Spirit to do wonders and miracles if we understand we can't do it and get it and have it and keep it by the law. We're not going to go back to the law no more. But why would the law keep on creeping up though we confess it? Though we try our best to live it, we try our best not to feel guilty, we try our best not to live in a repentant state of repent, sorry, 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 sorry. We try our best to live the grace message, but living amongst grace people, they come up every now and then, what do you think I'm doing wrong? What do you think is wrong in my life? Where am I missing it? The law. So the only thing that can tell you you miss it is the law because the only knowledge of sin is by the law. If there's no law, there's no knowledge of sin. So why is the law still so strong after all our teachings of grace? Wow. Romans 7. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Now here it comes. That you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law. That being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. We are dead to the law by the body of Christ. We understand that is the cross, crucifixion of Christ. Head to the law. Okay, by the body of Christ. 
married to Christ. <clears throat> what did I put there? To bring forth fruit. Delivered from the law. Not only dead to the law, but delivered from the whole thing. Okay? And now to serve. John chapter 15. I am the vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Any branch in me that does not bear fruit, he cuts away, and he cleans and repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit to make it bear more and richer and more excellent fruit. Now, that scripture could be preached in condemnation, or you can read it in the context. If you don't bear fruit, if you are, I'm the branch, and I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you as a branch don't bear fruit, he does not throw you away, cast you away, cut you off. He comes and prunes you, lifts you up. And that word there in the Greek language is, he lifts you up so that you don't drag on the ground till you start bearing fruit. Get you out of some condemnation here today. So if you walk past the vine, some of the bottom branches would be hanging on the ground. And a proper vine dresser would come and lift up the branches and put little sticks under it tied with rope so that it doesn't drag on the ground so that it's a little bit above ground so that it can start bearing fruit. That is what he says here. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you don't bear fruit, I'm going to lift you up to help you till you start bearing fruit. Awesome. Listen to this. You are cleansed. And you are pruned already. So there's nothing stopping you of bearing fruit. Just a little bit of understanding of one or two scriptures that we're going to put in position tonight. Because of the word which I have given you. <laughs> I thought somebody's going to stick with me. The righteousness which our faith speaks in this wise. Do not say, who's going to bring Christ back? Who's going to bring him up? But this word is in you and in your heart. I've given you this word. By this word, you're already pruned. You've already got all the abilities. Don't go to the righteousness of faith by, by the law. Because Moses said, if you want to do that, you've got to live by that law. And if you go over one law, says James, you've got to keep the rest of it. And if you go over one, you've already transgressed all the law. So you are guilty. But if I get away, if I'm dead to the law, delivered from the law, and understand I'm now married to Christ to bring forth fruit unto God and serve in newness of spirit and know I've got the promise of the spirit, I will have a supply that will make me a wonder worker, a sign worker, and a fruit bearer. Now verse 4. Dwell in me and I will dwell in you. Live in me and I will live in you. Just as the branch can bear fruit, that just as no branch can bear fruit of itself without abiding in the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever lives in me and I in him bears much fruit. However, apart from me, you can do nothing. If a person does not dwell in me, he's thrown out. If you live in me, and my words remain in you, and you continue, and the words continue to live in your hearts, ask whatsoever you will, and it shall be done for you. When you bear much fruit, which is getting answers to all your prayers because of the dwelling in me and I in you. My Father is honored and glorified, and you show and prove yourself to be true followers of mine. So in John 17, Jesus says, Father, I pray that you make them one. As I am in you and you are in me, and we are one. Would you make them one? I in them and they in me. Amen. 
For this reason, I will give them my glory, as you have given me your glory. So, Father, would you now give back the glory that I had with you before the world began? Father, glorify your name. Okay, my Father will be glorified if you start bearing much fruit. Oh, I'm going to explain the fruit. Whatsoever you'll ask, you'll get. Oh, I'm going to help you to understand how you can get whatsoever you ask. If my word will continue to abide in you, and you will continue to abide in me. Oh, I'll just back it up. If I dwell in you and you dwell in me. If I am the vine and you are the branch and you stay in me, and we are one. Father, would you make them one? Do you want to know what the word one means? Mary. Do you know what the word Mary means? One. Therefore, the man shall forsake his parents and cling to his wife, and they shall be one. Oh, don't try and sort it out with man and husband. It never works. I'm not talking about a marriage. I'm talking to you about a mystery, which is Christ and the church. Okay. We are dead to the law by the body of Christ. To be married to Christ. To bring forth fruit unto God. To serve in unity of spirit. Okay, I want to help you. I'm the branch and you, I'm the vine, you are the branches. My father will dress the vine. If you now dwell in me, and I now dwell in you. So if we are really one. If you understand your married situation with Christ. You will live in newness of spirit. Which means the oldness of the letter will have no touch on you. But you've got to understand married. Chapter 14, verse 27. Peace I leave you. My peace I now give and bequeath you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Do not let your heart be troubled. You heard me tell you I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you really loved me, you would have been glad. Because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater and mightier than I am. And now I have told you before it occurs, so when it does take place, you may believe and have faith in and rely on me. I will not talk with you much more, for the prince of this world come, he's got no power in me. Satan is coming and we have no dealings with another. Okay? The end. Rise, let us go from here. Verse 23. Jesus answered, if a person really loves me, he will keep my word. If you abide in me and my word abide in you, you will ask whatever you will, and it shall be done unto you. And therein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So if we understand we are married to Christ, we will bring forth fruit unto God. What is fruit? By asking and getting. I'll prove it to you. We're going to go slowly. God is glorified. Herein is my Father glorified. So God gets glory. God does not get glory with you. Father, can I have? Father, can God gets glory when you ask him? Bam. So is the problem on God's side? Or is the law short circuiting something on our side? Do we understand the marriage, the oneness, the vine? The unity, the fruit bearing, the dwelling, and my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home our special dwelling place with him. Okay. Now we're going from backwards. If you love me and keep my word, then the Father and I, which are one, which I prayed later on, 
that I prayed later on that you will now be that one, Mary. We will come and make a special dwelling place with you. But don't let your heart be troubled because I tell you this stuff because I can see you now troubled. You don't know how it's going to happen. But the Father and I will come and we will make our dwelling place with you. Verse 12. I send you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than he shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Here it comes. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Verse 16, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth in the world cannot receive because it seeth him not. Verse 18, I will not leave you comforters, I will come to you. Verse 20, that day you shall know that I am in the Father and you are in me and I in you. Verse 23, if a man love me, he will keep my commandments. My father will love him and we will come unto him and make our dwelling place with him. Verse 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. Verse 2, in my father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And when, if I go and make ready a place for you, I will come back again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. So Jesus says, if you can understand how we can be one, I will dwell in you, you will dwell in me, we will be married. And if we are then one, my Father will be glorified, you will keep my word, and whatever you ask, you get. Because I'm telling you how I am doing what I'm doing. It's not me. It's the Father that dwells in me. The words that I speak are not mine. It's the Father that dwells in me. So we are one, I and the Father. So I pray that you will be one. So the Father and I that are one will come and find our dwelling place with you so that you can be one with us as I am with him and him so that you can do the greater works because I will send you the Holy Spirit that will teach you that we are actually one. But if you go to the law, the Spirit stands outside. If you go for the Spirit, the law will have to go. So we are dead to the law, delivered from the law, redeemed from the law by Christ's body on the cross to be married to another, to be one with Christ, to be the dwelling place. So in my Father's house are many dwelling places. I am going to prepare that place. And when I've prepared it, I'm going to come back to make sure that you are where I am. So where are you, Jesus? In the Father. Where's the Father, Jesus? In me. What are you? Oh, I'm the dwelling place. So what are you going to prepare? Oh, I'm going to get you out of the law into the Spirit so that you can be a dwelling place. So that we can have a big house full of dwelling places. And if you understand that unity and have that word in you, whatsoever you ask, it'll just be done. Because it's not you, it's the newness of spirit, the Father and the Son, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Ephesians 2, Colossians 2, right on the inside of us. Imagine what God is thinking of you. Married. Amen. Awesome. Yeah, because of time's sake, you know, I can't dwell on every scripture, but I can dwell on the dwelling place. 
chapter 12, verse 20. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. And they came to Philip, which were the Sida, and said, We'd love to see Jesus. Philip, come and tell Andrew, and, and Andrew again tell Philip, and they tell Jesus. And Jesus said, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily I send you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bring forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life shall save it in life eternal. He's not talking about you, he's talking about himself. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, they shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I into this hour. Father, glorify thy name. And then the voice came, glorify, glorify, verse 31. Jesus said, now is judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all to me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, we have heard out of the law that Christ abide forever. How do you say the son of man must be lifted up? Who is the son of man? Verse 35, let's jump to the Amplified. Jesus said, you will have the light only a little while longer. Walk while you have the light. Keep on living by this light, so that darkness may not overtake and overcome you. Who walks about in the dark does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light. Have faith in the light. Hold to the light. Rely on the light. That you may become sons of light and be filled with light. I am the light. You can now walk in this light. But if you believe what I say, you will all become sons of light. Uh You ready? So listen to Jesus, same story, just another version. Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world. Comma. A city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they will see, are you ready, your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. If you shine your light knowing that you are a city that's set on a hill, your Father will be glorified. Herein is my Father glorified that you bring forth much fruit. How do I bring forth much fruit? By knowing whether I'm a dwelling place, by knowing the Spirit is in me, by living in the newness of the Spirit, by getting out of the law once and for all, by understand I'm one married to Christ. Glorify. Revelation to anyone. Verse 3. And I heard a great voice in heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them. <laughs> and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. Verse 5, and he that sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha, I am the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to him that is thirsty of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So Jesus is at the well. There's a woman drawing water, and Jesus said, can I get water? She says, you have nothing to draw water with. He says, woman, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that was speaking to you, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. John chapter 7. On the last day of the great feast, Jesus stood up to fulfill scripture and cried out with a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, 
God. Let him now come to me. And as the scripture says, he that believeth out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And this he said, verse 38 and 9, of the Holy Spirit, which was not yet poured out, for Jesus was not yet glorified. Father, glorify me. I have. When did he pray the prayer? The night when he was betrayed. Where did he pray it? Around the supper table. Father, glorify me. Voice, phew, I've glorified it. Now, if you're thirsty, in a while, you'll see scriptures fulfilled. Take my body, nail it. Let's get this letter of guilt away. Let's get the law out of the way. Let's get sin and death out of the way. Let's take my body. Let's deliver you, redeem you from the law. Let's get married. Let you and I get one. It is finished. You can now come and take of the water of life freely. It's finished. Hmm? Verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels with the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me, come saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and a high mountain. Now he's explaining the bride. And he showed me a great city. The holy Jerusalem. Descending out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God. And her light was like a stone most precious. Verse 16, and the city lied four square. Length, breadth, height, all the same. Ephesians 3, verse 14 through 16. For this reason I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he may grant you, and then he goes on, verse 16, to be strengthened with might in the inner man. 17, so that you can comprehend with all the saints in heaven and on earth what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge so that you can be filled with all the fullness of God. <laughs> Revelation 19. Verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. And he said unto me, write, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship, and he said, See that you do it not. I'm your fellow servant and your brethren that are the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw heaven opened. And I behold a white horse, and that sat upon it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judged and made war. His eyes were a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written, so no man knew but himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth go a sharp sword that he should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty. And he has a vesture on his thigh name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourself together unto the supper of the great God. Let's go to Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 7. Hush, be silent before the Lord God, 
For the day of the vengeance of the Lord is near. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice and he has set apart for his use those who accepted the invitation to the sacrifice. Now Jesus says in Matthew and in Luke, I will not partake of this table again till it is fulfilled in the kingdom. I will not have bread with you and I will not have wine with you till it's fulfilled. So Luke 24, there's two guys on the way to Emmaus coming from Jerusalem from the crucifixion. They're walking, their hearts are filled with sorrow. Jesus come walking with them and start asking them questions about whatever happened in Jerusalem. They say, are you a stranger? Don't you know what happened? They ask him and then he start telling them. Oh, do you? And he starts telling them the prophecies of what they tell him. There. And he made like he was just passing by. And they said, no, it's late. Come in. So it means the day is already long. This was the morning for Mary. This was already late at night because they said, you can't, you, you go, come, come in. And when he came in, the Bible says, and he took bread. Thank you. And he thanked the Father, and their eyes were opened. And they said, were our hearts not burning on the inside of us when he was walking with us on the road? The Bible says, and later that day, while the eleven was at table, Jesus appeared in the midst of them. And for joy, they could not speak. And he said to them, touch me. King James would say, handle me. So what's he saying? The little while is over, your sorrow is turned into joy. I've been to the Father, you are now ready to be a dwelling place. Back to chapter 20 of John. Later the same day, he appeared unto the eleven. Same story as Luke 24. The morning he said to Mary, Don't. now he's back. Now the eleven is there. He appeared in their midst and he breathed on them. Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Amen. The little while is over. When you see me again, I will give you the comforter. Yes. Not Pentecost, not the fulfillment, not the outpouring. The comforter is now here. Because I'm, I'm not, I can only appear now. I'm now in another realm. Yeah. Yeah. So, phew, receive ye the Holy Spirit as the Father has sent me. Even so, now send I you. Pa! First Corinthians 11. Let's read and then we're going to eat. Verse 23. I have received of the Lord, which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed to bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same also he took the cup, when he supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This you do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Okay. I'll put it in the words of tonight's message. For whenever you take this bread and eat it as my body, whenever you take this cup and drink it as my blood, you renew your wedding vows. Whoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, not knowing what Romans 7 says. Not knowing what Galatians 3 says. Shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. 
But let a man examine himself, and let him so eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation over himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak, many are sickly, and many sleep. Reverse it in another place. You will not be weak, you will not be sick, and you will not die if you discern that this is the Lord's body. Amen. The word discern is not like our English word discern. The Greek word there is to separate. See what the blood is for and see what the body is for. He said, we are dead to the law by the body. To be married to Christ. Bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. He said, I'm speaking a mystery, Christ and the church. So, a sacrifice has been prepared. The invitation is out. Amen. Would you take the invitation yes. Yes. Amen. and come receive the body and receive the blood? If you do, you renew your wedding vows. Hallelujah. You are one with Christ, and the works that He do shall you do also, and greater works than you shall. And He will supply you with His marvelous Holy Spirit and work wonders among you because the place has been prepared. The Comforter has come. You are filled with the Holy Spirit, one with Christ, ready to bring forth fruit unto the Almighty God. Bless all you fruit bearers for God. Bless you, bride of Christ, wife of the Lamb. You are blessed to be married to Christ. You can bring forth fruit. You don't have to be sick. You don't have to be weak. And you don't have to die. Life! So in the night the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, broke it, thanked the Father. Father, we thank you. He said, this is my body. He didn't say it resembles his body. He didn't say it's an example of his body. He said, this is my body. If you can discern it, take it aside and eat it as my body. All the blessings of the body. This teaching of tonight, wham. I can mark the marks how the anointing increased in our ministry around the table of the Lord when I shared this revelation. So if you eat it as my body, no weakness, no sickness, no death. But apart from that, dead to the law, married to Christ, bring forth fruit, delivered from the law, newness of the Spirit. Behold, I make all things new. Come to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The invitation is out. The sacrifice has been prepared. In Bosra, clothes sprinkled with red blood, trampling the wine press alone. It is done. The righteousness of the saints are the white clothes with which the Lamb are riding. Yes, Lord, we will ride. Let's eat. In the same manner, he took the cup. And he said, this is the New Testament. In my blood, drink it. For the remission of sins. Oh yes. And do it till he comes again. Amen. Remember my death till I come again. <laughs> In other words, keep on reminding yourself that this is my marriage. We bless the body and the blood of Jesus. As the body and the blood. In nomine patri, it fill it spiritus sancti. It means in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit.